Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. We're thrilled to be coming to you live from the heart of Atlanta at Modex 2024, right here at the Georgia World Congress Center. A shout out to our sponsor, GNP Construction, your go to provider for comprehensive turnkey material handling and solutions in both logistics and commercial needs. We are truly grateful for the support. The innovation isn't just the ability to stick a robotic arm on a mobile base. The innovation is in being able to do that in a cost efficient manner, which delivers not just equivalent, but superior ROI to customers. And then obviously all the software around that. Welcome Ecom Logistics Nation. We're thrilled to be coming to you live once again from the heart of Atlanta at Modex 2024, right here at the Georgia World Congress Center. Also, another massive shout out, shout out for our incredible sponsors, GNP Construction, who are sponsoring the podcast here at Modex. Now, we are thrilled to welcome and be joined by Andre, VP Growth and Marketing at Brightpick. Thank you for joining us. Super happy to be here. Amazing. Amazing. Well, listen, as a way of getting started, we'd love for you to give an introduction to, uh, to what you do at Brightpick and a little bit about your past history as well. For sure. So um, as you said, I'm VP of growth at Brightpick. So under me, I'm responsible for entering new markets, uh, business development, marketing, PR, all that good stuff. Uh, actually, my background originally is in finance. So I uh, started my career at M&A and then I uh, worked at Blackstone in, in multi-strategy investing, which is actually how I found, uh, how I met our uh, founder and CEO, Jan Jishka. So uh, we looked at potentially investing in Brightpick at the time. And then he asked me to join the company to help him scale it. Um, and he's really a visionary. I think is um, he already founded a previous company before this called Photo Neo. So they're the leading uh, 3D vision technology provider. So they do 3D scanners uh, for, for, let's say, high tech, uh, ultra difficult 3D vision applications. So this okay. is your bin picking, quality inspection and industrial applications. Um, and then more recently, he founded Brightpick 2021. And Brightpick really is about fully solving the fulfillment needs of warehouses. So we provide a mobile robot solution, which automates every step of the fulfillment process uh, from picking to consolidating and, and dispatching orders. And we can talk a little bit more about our solution, but really the, let's say, uh, unique selling point of it is that our robot is the only mobile robot in the world that can robotically pick items directly in the aisles where they're stored. So it's almost like you can imagine a human walking around the warehouse aisles with a cart and picking items. And that is hugely more efficient than, you know, having a human sit there and wait for robots to go back and forth, back and forth each time just to bring items. Uh, instead, you know, we have robots that actively pick those items directly where they're stored. So that obviously saves a lot on uh, you know, cuts out unnecessary travel distance and so forth. And, and customers really love it. So uh, we're aggressively scaling. And, and, you know, the beauty of Modex is the fact that Andre's talking to me about like what they do. He shows up earlier uh, to the booth, like, and he goes, hey, this is what we do. And I know a bright pick. I walked by their booth a couple of times and I kind of made a, a, a set of assumption as an example, right? Around what they do. And Andre's like, no, 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 let me show you. And like, I walked up, which was just down the hall. We had a conversation. He shows it to me exactly how it works. And I go, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And to the point that Andre actually made was the only robot you said that actually picks from the bin location, right? Correct. So just for the audience, right? It is an AMR that has an arm that's attached to the AMR that's got suction and other capabilities depending on the, the type of products you carry that walks up or goes to the location, pulls the bin out, takes the product at once and puts it into the discrete pick bin. So you can have two orders at a time, split the bin. So that means you got three or four orders at a time or split it further, which would be four, five, or six orders at a time, right? Yeah, we can batch pick. Exactly, yeah. So, very cool. So, 
To that point, obviously we're here at Modex, but to the point of why so many organizations and companies are here, and it's what Nanad just said, right? Maybe there's preconceived notions or understanding, but when you could actually see something live without having to go do a facility tour and you could come here and see that, that's probably where the real value of being here at Modex is. No, I think, as you said, um, especially in our case, like by now, every second integrator has an AMR solution, right? Yes. AMR solutions, they're they're no longer unique. And, you know, we're, we see the AMR market as having started with Kiva, right? That was founded 20 years ago, acquired Correct. by Amazon. Then you had sort of a quiet period when Amazon was rolling it out. Then you had Locus Robotics with the, you know, assisted picking and the... Yep. Uh, let's call it uh, person to goods systems. But since then, there really hasn't been much innovation, right? You have the same Kiva system that are now being uh, used by every second integrator out there. Sure, you know, they go higher, they go denser, but, you know, the essence is the same. And really with our product, which we call Brightpick Auto Picker, uh, we view that as really the next iteration of innovation in the space because uh, the innovation isn't in just the ability to stick a robotic arm on a mobile base, you know, if I'm kind of brutal, any idiot can do that. <laughs> uh, the innovation is in being able to do that in a cost efficient manner, which delivers not just equivalent, but superior ROI to customers. And then obviously all the software around that. So if you see our robot in person, you're going to notice that, for example, it has a pretty basic SCARA arm, which is a two axis arm, which just moves up and down and to the side. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, why don't you stick a six axis, you know, universal robots arm on it? Makes well, a sense. few reasons. One is a one single UR, UR arm is going to set you back $25,000, which is more than the cost of an entire AMR. And second, we don't actually need it. So, you know, in combination with our proprietary suction cups, uh, which are very versatile and, and mobile, our 3D vision, which we actually have from PhotoNeo and the AI, which identifies the products and let's call it the most optimal gripping points, we can achieve, you know, 99.5% of the, of the capability of a six axis arm at literally one tenth of the cost. And that's where the innovation is, right? To be able to deliver a solution that delivers the labor savings, delivers the efficiency and does it at a equivalent cost. I mean, the, the, I, I would agree with you. 100% on the six axis arm, right? Like it just seems like overkill. It does, it's not needed in a platform of this nature. But as you start thinking about, uh, media type or, or product type more than media type, the product type that you're carrying right now, your arms got a single suction cup, right? How do you kind of get over that? Because you know, when I walked up, there was a bunch of bags of Cheetos over there, which I really <laughs> felt like I needed one bag. And Andre actually graciously offered me one of the bags as part of the demo. Um, but you got Cheetos, but the next thing you're going to have is a case of Cheetos um, or a small case of Cheetos or an inner pack of Cheetos. And the arm required or the suction cup required is going to be different. I mean, the arm required could be different because you, you might need a grip or over actually a suction cup. Um, how do you kind of look at that, right? Like, cause right now you got that. It's got to work through that. I got to slot things where the gripper becomes or the, the suction cup becomes kind of the limitation. How do you grow into different types of product categories that you might have to carry? And I'm, I'm sure you got a plan. So that's why I'm asking. No, it's a great question. Um, so basically right now we can pick groceries, pharmaceuticals, electronics, cosmetics, uh, polybagged apparel all day. Um, the weight limit on the gripper is five pounds. Uh, but the beauty of our solution is in addition to the in aisle robotic picking, each robot, each auto picker also has goods to person capabilities. So you can imagine the way it works, right? Each robot carries the order tote where it consolidates the picks and it retrieves the donor totes from storage. And it can do one of two things. It can either use the robotic arm to pick the items from the storage tote to the order tote. Or, for example, if you have bowling balls, let's say, or full cases, which are heavier than five pounds, it just takes both totes to a goods-to-person station where a human picks from one tote to the other. 
And that also means that if for whatever reason, a robot fails to pick an item that it was supposed to pick, for example, let's say the packaging is damaged. Yeah. Uh, all it does is it tries to pick it three times. If it fails, it automatically goes to a person. And, and that is really important for customers because a lot of customers are highly skeptical of robotic picking because they're worried, okay, what's going to happen if, you know, I suddenly induct an item that is not robotically pickable? Or do I have to worry about making sure my entire, you know, SKU range in the ASRS is robotically pickable? In our case, no, you don't. You can actually have all the system, all the SKUs in one system. There's no single point of failure. The worst thing that can happen is it takes it to a human and the human does the pick. So that's what I mean when I say it's a full end-to-end solution, right? Um, and again, what customers care about is reliability and throughput. That That's the most important yeah. thing, right? Imagine you take the alternative, which is you take a goods-to-person system and you stick a robotic arm on it. What happens if you can't pick an item? Well, yeah, someone has to go there, reset the system, take the item out of the system, you know, deal with all the software complication that arises from that. It's a pain in the neck. I right? can imagine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I've seen some other platforms that has the arms kind of like attached to various different arms. And depending on what they are picking, like the arms are articulating. Where it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty cool. I'm, yeah, we, we, we plan to we go in there. We go in there. Similar. Yeah, we go in there. Okay. Awesome. I mean, awesome. we have uh, close to 200 suction cups in our, let's say, development base. Uh, so depending on the customer skew range, we'll choose the most appropriate one. And for example, we have one installation with a pharmaceutical customer where uh, 90% of our robots have our standard suction cups, but the other 10% have smaller ones. And then depending on the types of items being picked, those are allocated to the different robots. Makes complete sense. Makes complete sense. Yeah. And I haven't been over there to get my bag of Cheetos yet. So I, I'm going over tomorrow to uh, to see it. But I have a question just based off of how you guys were describing it. I, you know, a lot of my background is in the 3PL space. So if I have existing, let's just call it library shelving that's in place, are we saying that that actually can stay? It doesn't need to be replaced. And the, and the, and, and the solution will, will work with that infrastructure. In many cases, yes. So our robots, they work with uh, standard shelving and totes. Our, our founder's philosophy is... We want to make the robot as capable as possible, but make everything around the robot as dumb as possible. So that all you need to worry about is, you know, you don't need fixed infrastructure. You can use commodity cheap shelving, which we don't have to provide. You can... Uh, so there's no rails on the shelving that you need like no, to pull it out? nothing. We use suction cups to pull so it it's, out. So it's doing like a yes. human type of pull. Correct. Oh, okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and so obviously not every type of shelving will be suitable, right? Uh, but we've done brownfield installations where, for example, we installed our robots in a shelf-supported mezzanine okay. where the company was previously doing manual picking from the shelves. So all the customer did is they bought totes, filled it up with totes, and installed our robots. Like, so you got that flow going. I guess the standard EMR solution one name names, you know exactly what we're talking about, competing. Um, or I should say, the locuses of the world, right? You, you are essentially uh, uh, six rivers, right? Like you're, com you're not truly competing with them because you, you have a very different platform. Again, you have to compete on the value proposition because when the customer is out in the market, they are trying to justify and understand what's the right thing to do. But in that frame, I think your true competitor in future as it's evolving is, and I have no opinions about this. So I would like to learn your viewpoint on the humanoid robot segment, right? Like one of our um, friend's buddy happens to be the founder of uh, figure.ai, right? Which is a humanoid robot just got funded uh, by OpenAI, Microsoft, and Bezos. And a whole bunch of other names. And I think their very first use case is robotics as a segment. Uh, so I would love to understand your opinion on that. Like, where are we going? Because that's like, yeah. you got suction, they got arms, they walk in, they're doing the. I don't think they could go. How high up do you go? 13 feet. 
I don't think those robots can go 13 feet. That that is a challenge. So I would love to get your opinion. I'm sure you got a viewpoint. Yeah, I mean, um, or maybe I'm making an assumption, but yeah. No, no, you're right. Let's say maybe start all of this with an anecdote. Uh, you see a lot of these humanoids demos out here, and pretty much every single one of them. What is it doing? It's moving totes, right? right. So you have a incredible piece of technology, right? Like the development and the tech. Fantastic. But you have a robot that costs $250,000 moving totes from one shelf to the other, whereas we can have a robot that costs $20,000 do that. Probably better because it can go higher and it's on wheels. So it's faster. So I think with humanoids, and, and I'm probably not saying anything that's new to most people because the thesis with humanoids is really the flexibility that they provide. You know, the uh, let's say the mantra that people like to say is that these are robots built for the human world. But if you think about it, you know, 80% of processes in a warehouse or in a manufacturing plant, they are standardized. So for example, when you're doing fulfillment, you're only doing fulfillment, right? You don't, you don't need to take, if you're a 3PL or a retailer, your core business is always going to be picking orders for customers right? Yep. So you don't need a robot that can pick orders and put totes into trucks <laughs> and do, you know, clean the floor. You need one solution that does fulfillment. You need one solution that does outbound. And then the last 10 to 20%, yeah, that's when humanoids might be valuable, right? Those edge Agreed. cases where it's extremely hard to find a standardized platform. But really when we're talking about, you know, specific processes in warehouses, plants that are constantly repeating, that's where solutions such as, for example, Brightpick Auto Picker, they will always be more cost efficient than a humanoid. And if you think about it at its core, our robot, it's doing exactly what a humanoid would do, exactly to your point. It's going there, it's taking the totes out, it's picking from the totes, and it's consolidating an order. Like a human with a cart. Exactly, exactly. Right? Like, so, again, this is not a pre-thought of opinion, but like, the way I think about that is I'm about to geek out. Human evolutionary biology, right? Like, so, so, let's, let's go back to you know, Darwin, right? Like, we went through a motion of why we are who we, we are and the dexterity is it's fight or flight, it's designed for hunting, gathering, right? Like, cause that's what we wear for the longest time as human body is concerned. Um, yeah, strength is an equation that goes into it that a robot can bring, but like is human form factor. It's not evolutionary. Evolutionary biology has not made us to fast pick orders. Is it really the best <laughs> form factor to actually, I mean, I'm just being very honest, right? Like I, I don't know the answer, but like the answer sounds like a no. Well, I think really like, this is my opinion where humanoids will shine in the future is in those edge cases that I described and in consumer facing applications. Exactly. Cause when you're a consumer, let's say you want a robot at home. You need a robot that is able to do a thousand different things because otherwise, you know, one day you need to clean the floor. Another day you need to take the grocery bags. You're not going to be doing that every day, all day, like you would in a, in a warehouse. Um, but I think this is the, let's say, call it hype cycle, call it adoption yeah. curve. You yeah. know, these companies, they need to start somewhere. And, you know, moving totes is a very simple application. Warehousing is like, I mean, look, as an innovation is concerned, like, the 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 warehousing space has definitely provided robotics companies the catalyst for high level of adoption that you did not see in other spaces before. Like you just did not see that. And so if you are a robotics platform, this is an autom autom uh, automotive might be another segment, a little manufacturing, another segment. But from a moving robot standpoint, warehousing is like the space, right? So it seems like anyone that's getting into robotics be like, oh, cool, let's go there, right? And I agree with you. It's like, it might be more in tune to other like human interaction where you need the human form factor, maybe hunting, gathering, I don't know if you need to do that, right? Like, 
but warehousing might not be it. The fact that like I can pick a box and walk around, like conveyors are way better at doing that than a $250,000 robot. Just like being honest, right? Like so. Or AMRs on wheels. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like th- th- let, let's, let's go down that route than actually figuring. And I respect the investment is definitely from the companies that I mentioned is not towards the warehousing distribution for them. It is the yes. form factor and what it serves. But the form factors decided that warehousing is an easy space to get into. But someone said it today, and this is the third episode I'm going to actually talk about. It's like the shiny object syndrome, right? It's like people want it inside their warehouse to show it to their stakeholders, shareholders, clients, whoever you might want to call it. It's like, I got a robot walking through the warehouse. I might be completely wrong. And no, I, this I entire statement might yep. come back to bite me. But the fact of the matter is, you just don't freaking see. Yep. I think it's exactly as you said, like it's easy for companies to pilot a humanoid because it's fantastic marketing. It's amazing, right? It's, right? Like it's easy marketing. I someone told me today, like, yeah, we you know. Humanoids, they're a real thing because Amazon is testing them in their warehouse. I don't think that means much, right? Exactly. Like, right. When Amazon has a warehouse that is run by humanoids, I'll bite my tongue. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm willing to bet that that's not going to happen. Completely agree. Completely agree. Completely agree. What do you think, Dad? <laughs> well, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back from the hunting and gathering for yeah, exactly. a second. And, I'm uh, sorry. I, no, like, no, I, I, that was Evolutionary good. biology. Do you agree with that? Yes, or not? absolutely. Like, have you, and for all the listeners, there is a, a, a book called uh, Homo Sapiens by Noel Yoahari, right? Like he's a, he's a amazing author, by the way. Uh, and he connects history with evolutionary biology with like, why we are who we are. And like, I take a chapter out of that book, right? Like, why are we the way we are? And it's like, it might not be the best form factor for warehousing. I mean, maybe a couple million years from now, if we are doing a lot of warehousing, uh, evolution might take us down that path of becoming really efficient pickers. Like having two arms. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) we weren't designed to pick. Having you know a saying? tote instead of a belly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, no, and, and ultimately it all comes down to cents and dollars, right? Yes. Because again, don't get me wrong. I love technology. I love flexibility. But are you really willing to spend 10 times more to have that? Yes. Right? Most customers aren't. They don't have that. They're, they're happy to pilot it, to test it. But when it comes to, you know, fully automating a facility or or doing that, you know, another example is in what world are legs more efficient than wheels, right? Wheels will always be more energy efficient, faster, more robust, easier to design, easier to install, fewer moving parts, easier maintenance than feet. And in a warehouse, I mean, warehouses are literally created for forklifts to run in them. How often are you going to have a (laughs) random pile of boxes or a pallet on the floor that you need to step over. Agreed. Agreed. Wholeheartedly. You know, before we, uh, before we wrap up one last question for you, you, you have a lot of insights. You're, you're talking to a lot of customers, e-commerce, three PLs, build themselves. Just wanted to uh, see if you could leave us with any final thoughts perspective, what trends you're seeing in the space? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, we had a couple of years of, of boom time during COVID where really the mantra was meeting excess customer demand. And, and that pushed a lot of companies to start exploring automation and dipping their toe with automation. So many companies became more comfortable with it. And that was followed by a couple of lean years where, you know, Volume growth came down or even turned negative, right? Interest rates went up, so capital became less available. So there was a lot less money around for automation. But at the same time, the companies and the buyers, they are a lot more comfortable with automation now than they were four years ago. 
Agreed. And a lot of them recognize that they need it to stay competitive in the medium term. So really, I would say last year was tough for everyone in the markets. This year, we already see a, a big recovery. Um, even in our case, for example, we, uh, we, we pretty much met our entire full year budget in the first two and a half months. Um, Love it. That's so beautiful. Oh my God. Thank you very much. My heart just like, Perpetration <laughs> went away because that's so kind of the me, sentiment. Yes, I agree. Someone told me that that means we did bad budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, like, that just means a lot of positive signals for the industry in general, that there is a lot more confidence. Definitely. Definitely. And I think, you know, you always have, for example, you know, we've had a lot of success with the grocers, with pharma companies, you know, for example, in e grocery. It's negative unit economics. You can never make it work without automation. So right. they have no choice. You know, pharma companies, they never had a pullback because, you know, they, they're, let's say, acyclical businesses. Yes. Um, but now within e-commerce and, and 3PLs, we're seeing a resurgence. For example, this month, we're going live with a customer called The Feed in Colorado. So they do sports nutrition supplements and they're installing 48 bright, bright pick auto pickers going to be picking 50,000 items a day and, and really uh, forward looking 24 seven operation. How many units per pick? Uh, I think per order, sorry, per order line, two units on okay. average. So that's your sweet spot. Yeah. Where do you break sweet. for our audience? Where do you break? Like what's the units per order lines? I would say when you have north of three, four picks per order line, that's where the robotic picking becomes less efficient than the human picking. Because a human can pick three, four items at once with one hand, whereas a robotic picker has to do it one by one. Yep. And it's not a problem for us if it's, you know, every 10th order line is like that, because we also have the ability to, let's say, set business rules where if you have to pick more than five items of this SKU, automatically go to a GTP. But when it's every single item, yeah, that's when obviously Beautiful. other systems make more sense. Um, I would say when it's very low order picks per order line, uh, that that really is customer specific because then you need batch picking. So then we basically batch our orders into one, but then you need the customer to have a put wall or so, some sort of software to sort it on their end once our robots deliver the items. I love it. He's ready with answers. Oh, he is. He is. Um, so listen, uh, as we wrap up here, I want to give you like, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Before you, you leave, please share with the audience where they could go to follow you on social media, uh, where they could go to learn more about Brightpick. Yeah, for sure. So we have a very active LinkedIn page, uh, Brightpick, our CEO, Jan Ziska. And then we have a very active YouTube channel uh, where we have a lot of cool videos. So make sure to check that out. All right. Sounds Excellent. good. Well, thank, thank you very you much. Again. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate you. As we bring another episode to a close here at Modex, we want to extend our gratitude to GNP Construction for their sponsorship of the podcast. If you're in need of top-notch, all-inclusive material handling solutions for logistics and commercial real estate, look no further than GNP Construction. Be sure to visit GANDPConstruction.com to discover your one-stop shop for turnkey MHE integrations. Hi, I'm Ninad Acharya, CEO and co-founder of Fulfillment IQ. And I'm here with Dan Call, CRO and partner at Fulfillment IQ. We're the team behind the Ecom Logistics Podcast. Our mission is to provide you with genuine insights from our work alongside logistics leaders to help you improve your supply chain. In the Ecom Logistics Podcast, we share the knowledge and the insights we've gained from working alongside amazing brands, retailers, 3PLs, and VCs, so you can make the most out of your supply chain journey. If you like what you're hearing, we truly appreciate your support with a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting channel. Your feedback not only keeps us going, but also helps others find the podcast. If you think Fulfillment IQ can assist you, or if you have an idea related to logistics, just reach out to us on LinkedIn. We're always up for a chat and ready to explore new possibilities together. Stay tuned to the Ecom Logistics Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for fresh and practical insights into e-commerce and logistics. Until next time, let's keep making a difference.